Welcome to the Real Estate Investor Summit podcast, coming to you straight from the smallest big town in Texas with your host, mentor, and owner financing master, Mitch, a.k.a. Be The Bank Steven. The possibilities of life without a J-O-B start here. So grab your pen and paper and listen up. Y'all just might figure out how to fail forward to financial freedom. This is Mitch, and welcome to the Real Estate Summit podcast. I'm your gracious and wonderful all-knowing host, of course, of course, of course, Mitch Steven. Um, I'm really glad to be here today, and I'm flying solo today. So I'm going to talk to you about partners and uh, who and how and why partners and maybe why not partners. But right now, let's pay a little homage to our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Oh, thank you, thank you. I love my sponsors, great people. Go ahead and connect with them. You'll be glad you did. All right, today's topic, about partners. So I've had a ton of partners. Uh, in my my biggest year ever, which um, I say biggest, it was the biggest in volume. It wasn't the most money I ever made. Because while I was doing 150 houses that year, purchasing 150 houses uh, and selling 100 of those houses by the end of the year, having 50 houses in my inventory on January the 1st of the next year. Um, I had a lot of money coming in the front door, but I had a whole bunch of money going out the back door because I hadn't become an experienced uh, systems person, and I was trying to run it all myself, and I just couldn't cover all the bases. And when you can't cover all your bases, people take advantage of you. Um, so that's like 1.7 closings per day. That's, that's 250 transactions. And if you take out weekends and holidays, well, not even holidays, you just take out weekends, that ends up being 1.7 uh, closing transactions per, per day, working day. And so these, uh, these days were very stressful. And one of the reasons I was able to do that volume is that we opened up the floodgates in um, San Antonio, Texas. We told the world, uh, and I say the world, we told the city, the 1.7 million of them, that if they could bring a great deal on property, on a property, you know, a property that we could buy for 50 cents on the dollar, then we would put up the money and partner with them, and they would no longer have to look for money. They'd just split the deal with us 50-50. You wouldn't believe uh, in a very short period of time how many people showed up, and there was a line out our front door every day, and we were looking at deals like madmen. Um it sounds glorious, it sounds fun, but let me tell you, this is where we met the good and the bad and the ugly, and boy, did some of it get ugly because we were partnering with people simply because they had found a great deal, and we were not factoring anything else into our decision, and we met some real doozies, let me tell you. So let me just tell you a little bit about the partners I've had. I've had, and when I say the partners that I've had, I'm talking about legitimate partners where we went and formed an LLC and we went into some kind of business together, not the partners like the guys who brought a house for sale and I put up the money and we partnered on that one house. By the way, the good thing about partnering by the house was that if we didn't have fun working with that partner or we saw some deficits or we saw some, some tendencies that we didn't like or that scared us, usually uh, liability uh, tendencies like the inability to tell the truth, um, the, inabil the inability to, to, to collect cash at the, at the site, at the house, and then bring it back to the office, things like that, you know, just the inability to do basics. And a uh, good thing about partnering by the house was once the house was over, we closed out the books, and we didn't have to partner with them anymore. It was, you know, one in and done if if we didn't like you. And then the ones that we we liked to do business with that were honest and uh, knew how to get the money down to the bank or into the office and recorded and knew to be truthful about the houses to the people they were trying to sell houses to, to be truthful to the everybody all the way around the horn. I mean, we started doing – houses over and over and over with those guys. There was plenty of people in San Antonio that I've done over a hundred houses with. 
And I did that with one of my first real, real legitimate partners. We um, formed a company. We formed the Nuevo Land Company together, a guy named Sam. He doesn't, he's a humble guy. He doesn't want me to use his last name. But in my first book, My Life in a Thousand Houses, Failing Forward to Financial Freedom, I do my first 450 deals with a partner. And in that book, his name is Sam Ombre. Sam, my friend, truly is, uh, was my friend then and is my friend now. We band together mostly because we were scared. And, and, and we wanted, <laughs> we didn't say it like that back then, but we, we really, we wanted to hold hands and walk as a team down this gauntlet called house flipping and try to survive and not, not get ruined. And so Sam and I met one day talking about houses. I was selling a house. He was trying to buy it. I was, I was wholesaling a house. He was trying to buy it. He asked me how I was buying these houses. I told him I was buying the houses on, on my credit cards and, his eyes just flew wide open, and I asked him what he was doing, and he said, well, he was uh, trying to get houses under contract and then sell his contract to people like me who had a way to find the money. And we started talking about real estate on that day, and I don't think we stopped talking about real estate for 10 years after that. I think, I think except for when we were asleep, we woke up and we started talking about real estate from one end of the spectrum to the other, and it never stopped. He was a great partner, but... We ended up fitting together for the right reasons, but it really wasn't a conscious decision of would this be a good partner for me or what. We just started doing little things together, and we started doing more and more things together, and we grew comfortable with each other, and we grew into this partnership. We formed a corporation, and we took off, and uh, we did at least 400, something, 450 houses together. And by the time we had finished that many houses, no longer needed to hold hands. We had both grown up. We understood what we wanted to do and how to do it. And... It was time for us to become solo entrepreneurs, and we divided everything we had it up into two piles. Uh, one guy divided it in two piles, and the other guy got to pick a pile. And we divided the, the houses that we had down the middle, and uh, we're, we went on our way. But we still had lingering commercial properties and stuff for a long time. But it was a great partnership, but wasn't a lot of thought put into it. It was just a partnership that happened because we started doing a deal together and then another deal together and then a couple of deals at the same time together and then more deals together and then we finally says well we better open up a corporation and decided how we was going to do this all legal and legit and become partners and so that's how that partnership started on um, the second partnership was a little bit different there was more thought into it but also had a long track record because one of the guys that we sam and i were borrowing money from his name was carlos Carlos was, in our eyes, a seasoned, mature, successful, successful, successful businessman, and he was loaning us money. Carlos courted us for a long time before he decided to loan us money. And then when I asked him, you know, when he said, okay, boys, I'm going to loan you all money, you know, we asked Carlos, how much money do you want to get out? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, he said, you can't get out enough. You can't get out enough money. And so Sam and I took that as a personal challenge. And that's when we opened up the floodgates and started the whole city that we'd partner with them if they brought us an outstanding deal. We met Carlos because of a high trust factor. Now, Carlos wasn't my first choice. He was a second choice. I didn't know Carlos, but the, my friend, who's the CEO of a bank in town, referred me to someone. And me and this guy got along great. And we were just, we were ready to consummate this business. He brought in his attorney to sit down with us to draw up the documents and write down what the relationship was going to be. And the attorney completely screwed the whole relationship. The attorney didn't want to be in the real estate business, had never been in the real estate business, didn't think his client should be in the real estate business. And he just poo-pooed all over the, the meeting until it just turned to crap, the whole meeting. And I walked out of there and uh, we didn't, we weren't partners. Turned out to be a good thing because, uh, you know, fast forward 20 years after that event, and I had always known that I'd known that guy since that day and I'd always kind of followed him and I followed him through the, you know, through the talk at the bank and, and through people I knew. It turned out to be good that I wasn't partners with that person. So I've learned to believe things happen for a reason. When that partnership got shot down, I went back to the CEO of the bank and, and, and asked my friend Steve if he had someone else in mind because the lawyer had ruined that potential partnership, told me about Carlos. And it wasn't really to be partners with this guy. We, I was looking for money to fund our deals. And so Carlos funded hundreds and hundreds of deals for Sam and I. And so when you do business with someone on that level and, and that closely, you learn who they are. And Carlos was certainly a man of high integrity. He was, the trust factor was very high. He was a person that we admired and was admired by many. He was very w wealthy, 
and he had created and sold several major, major businesses. After Sam and I went our own ways, and I took some time off for a few years, and then I, I thought, well, well, I want to get back into the game. About that time, I had a tragedy happen in my life. Uh, 30 days later, 9-11 happened. You know, it was just a really bad time all, all, all around the globe, it seemed like. I needed to get busy and get my mind occupied. And so the first person I thought to call was Carlos. And I went into the mobile home business with Carlos. And we bought about 140 mobile homes in six weeks. And all these mobile homes were in other people's parks. And so we were, our mobile homes were sitting on rented lots and we, we owner financed the mobile homes. I picked Carlos. The reason why I'm telling you about this, I picked Carlos because of his high trust factor, his high integrity and his financial status because I, I was going to need him deep pockets to keep me rolling. I didn't necessarily pick him because he was going to do a lot of work, but he also had an infrastructure and an office already. The man had financed hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of cars that were sold on tote your note car lots. And so he knew about financing and he just seemed like a good fit, someone I could trust. I did not think that he would um, match me in work though, but I was willing to work more since he was going to be fundamental in funding everything. So that was the balance there. And then I had another partner that I picked up because I got so good after the relationship with Carlos and the mobile home thing kind of went its course and we got all the people in the houses making payments. There wasn't a whole lot to do anymore. We kind of sat down. The private money just kept coming in. I kept I kept finding private investors and more private investors. And then the private investors I had were giving me more money. And I was started to buy some houses on my own at that time, just picking up, you know, stick-built houses and buying them for X and then owner financing them for 2X plus a down payment. And that was going pretty good. But I raised so much private money that I couldn't spend it all. I couldn't find enough houses. And so I had been rubbing shoulders sort of with this guy named Raymond. And Raymond was a very talented person. He had a long, great history. He had a degree in business, and he was he was a licensed CPA. He had a degree from the University of Texas. He was a licensed CPA. He was a managing partner, which when I say managing partner, that's like when you have the – if you're a managing partner of a law firm, you know, you got your name on the door. Well, he was a managing partner for uh, Coopers and Libran in Austin, Texas for 15 years, a highly responsible job. It later became PricewaterhouseCoopers. So he was a managing partner for that company. He was taking businesses public. He was doing debentures. He was raising capital for, I don't know. I mean, I can't even explain everything he does because it's so high level above my head that I don't even know. But I knew that. I knew he was a highly sophisticated, highly responsible an honest man to be in that position. And when it came time to pick a partner, I wanted to start a hard money loan business because I found that when um, I had too much money and I couldn't get it out and people were sitting with their money on the sidelines, they would end up losing that money somehow. Or in some cases, just tying it up to where when it was time for me to go over and borrow it, they didn't have it anymore. So the way to avoid that would be to start a hard money business and loan the money out myself to my competitors at 50 cents on the dollar. So I mean, if a house was worth 100,000, I'd loan them up to 50, 55, 60,000, maybe at the most, and collect the spread between what I was paying my private lenders and what they were paying me. And I'd collect the spreads and maybe a couple of points. And then if they ever defaulted, I would just take the houses back and I would get the houses at great deals as if, you know, the same kind of deal I would want if I was just trying to buy the house directly. So I wanted to start this hard money business, and I took on this third partner, but I took him on for certain reasons, you know, and this was a thought process. It wasn't like the first one where I just morphed together. It wasn't like the second one with Carlos where, you know, I had a long relationship with him, and I knew who he was, and I dealt with him for a long time. This guy was pretty much someone I'm just meeting for the first time, but we did research on each other, and that's another thing, you know. When you decide to go into partners with people, you need to know them really well. We, we put our financials out on the table together, side by side. There was no – because, you know, you don't want to go into business with people that are broke or that have financial problems because desperate people do desperate things. And so you got to make sure that your partners, you know, are at a certain level and their lives are running in the background like they appear to be running in the foreground. And so Raymond and I picked each other after researching each other and we went into that business let me just say i was in business with sam for probably close to eight years maybe 10 years if you want to count some things that dangled in the background for a long time yeah yeah 10 years i was partners with 
I still am partners with Carlos in the mobile home business. We still collect some of those notes that we created back in 2003. So that's been in 12 years. Raymond and I formed our hard money loan company in 2005. So that's been, you know, about 11 years. I'm a good partner picker and I'm a good partner. That's what I want to talk to you about is how to pick partners. I have a fourth partner right now, but he found me and he found me for the reasons that I picked Carlos. He found someone who was an expert in the field that he wanted to go into, i.e. me. Uh, I'll take off my humble hat for the for a second and tell you, yeah, I'm an expert in that field. And he picked me for my financial my financial ability. He was finding a lot of deals, but he was not able to fund his deals and it was causing him a lot of stress and sometimes not making him look bad. And so he wanted to solve that problem and I could solve that problem. He also picked me because I had an infrastructure. He picked me because I had an office, I had a secretary, I had desks and chairs and computers and he didn't have to reinvent that. I already had that part handled. Uh, he liked how my office was. Every office needs improvement, believe me. But I mean, and every day and every week. But, you know, I had it going on and we had something to start with that was really pretty good. We had bookkeepers. We had bookkeeping systems. We had everything. And then last but not least, he picks me because of I, I have a real decent reputation in the town that I live in and that I work in. And those were the four reasons that he picked me. And I'm going to say this is the reasons, some of the reasons you should consider when you pick a partner. I mean, who is a good partner? What is a good partner? Why is it a, why is a person maybe a good partner? The number one ingredient has to be integrity. You cannot afford to pick a person without integrity. If you pick a person without integrity, uh, let's just say you, you pick a real, I don't know, what do you want to say? Filthy partner or dirty smelling partner, one that doesn't have a good reputation around town. Then that's going to rub off on you. Whether you do business with him right from that day forward all the way, people are still going to know that person. As a bad person, here, you know, good reputations are built over years and years. Bad reputations can be built in weeks and months, you know. And trying to get rid of a bad reputation is very difficult. It's hard to undo what people have said. You know, it's almost impossible to undo what people have said in the past. So you got to have integrity and reputation, please. And if you don't know who the person is, really, then you got to spend some time. I mean, hire a private detective for 200 bucks and do research on this person if you don't know them very well. It's a big sin to go into business and not really know someone, you know, at least have done the research. Number two, it'd be nice if the partner you were picking was had an expertise in the field that you were picking him for. I mean, you know, when my current partner picked me, I was an expert at what he wanted to do. There wasn't any doubt about it, you know. Uh, he wanted to do houses, and I'd done 1,500 houses. He wanted to do houses in San Antonio. I lived in San Antonio, and I did my 15 houses in San Antonio. And he wanted someone who could help him beat the learning curve. I mean, it took me 20 years to get where I'm at. This kid's going to be, in five years, is going to be close to where it took me 20 years to get because he picked the right partner, quite frankly. I'm not tooting my own horn here, but I'm just saying the guy picked a great partner picked a great partner, me. It took him a little while to get to me. I mean, he, he proved himself and proved himself. He was not stingy. He brought deals to the table that really didn't have anything to do with me sometimes and volunteered him into the organization and volunteered him and helped my bottom line. And, and when I saw that kind of attitude and I saw the honesty and the integrity in him, I said, yes. Actually, it was a little more complicated why I said yes. I mean, we ended up having like 33 deals together and my office was going crazy trying to keep our deals separate from my deals. And, and finally, uh, the office had had enough and just sat us both down and said, you guys got to form your, uh, another company and, and break all this out of my personal company because it's confusing everything. And so we did, and <laughs> there we are. We're partners. Number three is work ethic. What is the work ethic of the person that you're thinking about teaming up with? Do they have a history of getting up in the morning and going to work and focusing? And, and they may have a great history of that, but what's their plan going forward? Do they still Are they still going to want to get up in the morning and go to work every day, five days a week or seven days a week, as it may be when you're starting out a new business to proliferate the business? Or is this person going to be just a money guy and he's going to be playing golf while you're out busting your arse? I've seen it work both ways, but usually when there's just a money guy, the ass buster out in the field leaves when he comes of age financially. You know, when, when the ass buster no longer needs the money man's money, then there's no reason to have the partner anymore because the partner's just out playing golf every day. So that's what will happen in that relationship. But so you need to know what the person's work ethic is and what it was 
and what the, the work ethic is going to be going forward. Is he going to work or is he not going to work? You need to weigh that very heavily. The number four thing would be check to see, make sure that the person that you're going into a partnership, that their life is stable, both financially and emotionally. Because things that happen in your partner's life affect you, no matter what, no matter how it seems like it's, it's none of your business, it becomes your business. Uh, even things like, I mean, divorce, for heaven's sakes, divorce. And there's ways to set up companies, by the way, um, using trust and stuff, so that in case either partner gets divorced, the spouses can't mess up a whole business over it. You need to talk to a guy named Randy, Mr. Land Trust Hughes, about that. And you can find him on a podcast here at the Real Estate Investor Summit podcast archive series. So when I'm looking at a partner now, this is what I think about. I think about if I'm looking at a partner, I mean, there's two kinds of partners, really. There's partners with money that don't have any expertise in the business that are not going to help you build your business. They're just going to supply you money. This is probably the weakest type of partner that there is because you're only getting the money. And the, it takes more than just money to run a business. I would much rather have a partner that, that had a profile like this. Yes, he has money, and he can help fund the business or raise the capital, but he also is an expert and has been a long way down the road in the business that I'm trying to be successful in. Now, at this point in the conversation with this partner, I'm not only getting the money, but I'm, I'm getting valuable insight and a long history of experience from this man. And then last but not least, if I had a perfect world, I would want that partner to also show up at the office with me every day and, and put on the armor and go to war right next to me, you know, be on the horse right next to me as we charge into battle every day. And that would be the perfect partner, the guy with the money, the expertise, and is willing to work alongside you. I always figure this one thing, though. If this partner is bringing everything to the table, then I have to outwork him. Because he's bringing the money and he's working alongside of me. And he's not doing it to learn from me. I'm doing it to learn from him. So I have to outwork him. I'm the guy that works the weekend if someone has to work the weekend, not him. I'm the guy that stays late at the office, not him. And I always figure in this situation, since I'm coming, the lower man on the totem pole in the partnership would be me. Then I have to outwork this person. And at some point, this person deserves to not have to work as hard and can spend more hours at home because he brought more to the table at the time. So, Or you both work together to set up a system where you can both spend more time at home and let the office run the business. And that's where that relationship should go. You know, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about partners. I think, I mean, we could probably talk about it for, for hours and hours and hours, but I think that's in a nutshell, a good little conversation to review, if you're thinking about having a partner, don't get partners because you like each other. Don't get partners because you're friends. Don't get partners because you're exactly the same. You really want partners that you're exactly not the same. Like, I'm really good at X, and this guy's really good at Y. And because we have those two bases covered, this business could be really strong. Try to find people that have opposite talents than you have, and that's why you should partner. I mean, if you're both good at selling houses, that's not a reason to be in a partnership. You need one guy that's good at buying houses and another guy that's good at selling houses. Now we might have a plan. You follow me? And don't just pick partners because you're friends. Number one, you'll lose a great friendship over it. Number two, the business isn't going to work. you got to think about it way harder than just we're really good friends and we get along get together and we like each other, so we're going to start this business. That has been the recipe for many, many, many a failed business, I can promise you. And, I've, and I've, luckily, I haven't lived it, but I've seen it. All right, my friends, this is Mitch. I hope you like the conversation about partners. You've been listening to the Owner Financing Master, Mitch Be The Bank Steven, on the Real Estate Investor Summit podcast. Let us now blatantly and without apology bribe you towards financial freedom by offering you a whole bunch of free stuff. Go to reinvestorsummit.com and get you some, and you all come back now, you hear? 